We live in a culture that likes to reduce things to sound bites, catchwords, buzzwords. Quick and easy ways of boiling things down. So, of course, when we come to the Dharma, there's sound bite Dharma, catchword, buzzword Dharma. And it misses the fact that the Dharma has many dimensions. Sometimes we're told that Buddhism is all about a particular practice, like noting or spreading thoughts of goodwill and loving kindness. Sometimes we're told that it teaches basic principle, letting go, equanimity, contentment. compassion. And Buddhism does contain all of these things, but they can't be reduced to just one principle. So when you look at the practice, you have to realize there are many dimensions. There's how you deal with your own mind, and how your dealings with your own mind affect other people, your relationships to other people, and your relationship to things, the things you depend on for your life. And when you want to gauge the practice, gauge events in your own mind, and also gain a sense of what teachings really are useful to be applied in any particular way and how they should be applied, you have to look at things from several angles. The Buddha gave that list to his stepmother, the various tests for what counts as Dharma and Vinaya and what doesn't count as Dharma and Vinaya. And it applies to teachings, it applies to the way you interpret teachings and put them to use, and it applies to qualities that arise in the mind. And some of them focus primarily on your inner attitudes, like being dispassionate, being unfettered. And those two are very closely connected, because the passion that we feel for sensory objects is the fetter that keeps us tied. Not just objects of the five senses, but also ideas. We have a passion for ideas that keeps us tied down to them. And the Buddha puts these first in the list to show that these are the important ones. This is what it's all about, learning dispassion, learning to free the mind from the ways it fetters itself. You see this in the imagery the Buddha uses to talk about passion. that our passion for things is the way we cling, and the clinging, the word for clinging, applies not only to just holding on, but also to taking sustenance, the way a fire takes sustenance from its fuel. And in feeding on it, it has to cling, and clinging it's trapped. It's only when the fire lets go is that it's released. It's the same with the mind. When we learn how to let go to of our passion for sensual obsessions, and then on a deeper level learn how to let go of our passion for experiences of form or formless experiences. It's only then that we're truly free. But in following this program, you have to realize that the way you practice is going to have an impact. And the way your life affects other people. And you've got to take that into consideration. Also, your responsibility for your things, the things you depend on. This is why the Buddha includes other tests as well. In terms of relationships, the Buddha says the true Dharma teaches you to be modest. Teaches you to shed your pride. Teaches you to try to find seclusion as much as you can. And teaches you to be unburdensome. A lot of these things are mutually reinforcing. For example, if you learn how to be 
modest. That helps with the seclusion. In other words, we're working on good qualities of the mind here. And we're not trying to show off. We're not trying to impress people. We're doing it because the mind is like a sick person. It needs medicine. It needs to cure its illnesses. Just like going down to the doctor, you're not doing it to impress anybody. You're doing it because you've got an illness. You've got a cure. These all tie in with the two remaining qualities. On the one hand, there's persistence, in other words, putting right effort into the practice, which goes together with the principle of being dispassionate and getting unfettered. This is what has to be done. The effort has to go into this to develop skillful qualities, to let go of unskillful ones. And then there's contentment, which is how you relate to the things you have. So again, contentment fits in with being unburdensome. You learn to be content about the food you eat, the clothes, the robes you get, the shelter you get. You realize, okay, this is enough for the practice. And when you're content, that means you have to be in, there's less need to be involved with other people. If you're constantly wanting this, wanting that, you're going to be looking for this person and that person to provide it. But if you learn to be content with what you've got, it makes it easier to stay in seclusion. But if you look at these qualities, you notice also that some of them balance out possible imbalances in the others. For instance, we read about being dispassionate and being content. It could be interpreted as just sort of a letting things be as they are and not trying to stir yourself to change things. But then there's that principle of persistence. Because simply just lying around doing nothing and being content, that doesn't accomplish anything. The Buddha makes a clear distinction between being content with your surroundings and being not content with the level of skillfulness in the mind. After all, one of the primary factors that led to his awakening, he said, was the fact that he didn't allow himself to be content with whatever level of skillfulness he had until it led to the ultimate, until he'd reached the ultimate. That's why he used the image of the person whose head is on fire, whose turban is on fire. You put it out immediately. You can't just sit around and wait and be dispassionate about the fact that your hair is burning. The problems in the mind, you've got to deal with them. Then there's the relationship between being content and being unburdensome. It's interesting that in the Sutta on the Traditions of the Noble Ones, there are four qualities that count as traditions for the Noble Ones, and starts out with being content with food, clothing, and shelter. And knowing the fact that there are four requisites, you would think that medicine would be the fourth quality, but it's not. The Buddha talks about taking a delight in shedding taking a delight in abandoning. So what happened to medicine? Well, part of being unburdensome is that you do look after your health. There are lots of rules in the canon about what medicines are allowed to the monks, what treatments are allowed to the monks. So many that when Buddhism moved from India to other cultures, they carried Indian medicine along with it. So the monks are expected to know how to look after one another, to look after their diseases. Because if you let the body get diseased, it becomes a burden to other people, especially now with the fact that medicine is so expensive, treatments are so expensive. It's one of our responsibilities as practitioners is to make sure that we stay as healthy as possible. And yet we have to fight the tendency to get passionate about it. looking after the body, being really fit. You have to find a balance here. That's one way you have to look for a balance. There's another balance in that issue about being content and also shedding pride and being modest. Some people like to make a show over how 
frugal they are. And that, as the Buddha said, is one of the dangers of developing contentment in the wrong way or for the wrong motive. So you've got to look at these things from many, many angles. There are lots of stories from the forest tradition about teachers making sure that their students don't have just one eye. In other words, look at things from both sides. What about a John Mahambu in taking the ascetic practice of not accepting any food after his alms round? And he was very strict about that with himself. And he couldn't help noticing that other monks who at the beginning of the rains retreat had taken the same vow were beginning to give in to pressure from lay people who'd come late and they said, please accept our food. And so this monk gave in, that monk gave in, but Ajahn Mahabu was very proud of the fact that he didn't give in. He was going to stick with his vow. And two or three times during the rains retreat, when he'd be sitting, waiting for the meal to begin. He'd gotten his bowl in order, and he sat there with his eyes closed. And John Munn would appear out of nowhere with some food in his hand to place it in his bowl. He didn't do it too often, but he did it just enough to warn Ajahn Mahabua, okay, watch out for the pride. And then, of course, there's that story about Ajahn Chah going around the monastery after a storm, discovering that one of the huts had half its roof blown off. And so he asked the monk, well, why, aren't you, why aren't you fixing the roof? And the monk said, well, I'm practicing equanimity, learning how to sleep in the half of the hut that's still sheltered. And John Chai said, that's the equanimity of a water buffalo. Fix the roof. So when you're looking at the practice, you have to look at many sides. In John Cha's case, he's pointing out the fact that we've been given these things, you want to take care of them. People have been generous enough to provide food, clothing, and shelter for us. We've got to look after these things. You have to be responsible. You can't allow your contentment to make you lazy. or your desire to be unfettered, to make you irresponsible. So it's good to look at your practice from many angles and to realize that the fact that you're a living human being means that there are many dimensions to what you're doing. Your actions have an impact on your own mind, they have an impact on other people, they have an impact on your physical environment. And you have some responsibilities to your own mind and to other people and to your physical environment. And it's important that you learn how to keep them in balance. One misunderstanding I've been hearing a lot of recently is that the idea that the Buddha instituted the rules to please the lay people, so that whatever lay people want, the monks should oblige. Well, it's not always the case. There are many cases where people wanted the monks to behave in a particular way, and the Buddha said no monks who went out of their way to be nice and friendly and helpful to lay people in ways that the Buddha felt were inappropriate. He called this corrupting families. In other words, giving them all the wrong ideas about the role of monks. And John Furang talks about how when he was a young kid living in the monastery, that was back in the days when monks were expected to be doctors, and that's how they lived their lives. He lost count of how many times that someone would call in sick at night and the, the abbot had to go and look after that person's illness. And John Fung, as the temple boy, had to tag along to carry the medicines or whatever. And if people get used to that kind of service from the monks, then, then the monks suddenly have no time. This is one of the things that the forest tradition is really strict about. The monks are here primarily to cleanse their minds, to put forth the effort to get rid of passion and to unfetter their minds. And we don't want to tie them down with responsibilities that 
get in the way, that prevent that, that don't leave them any time. So it's a lot of balancing that has to be done. This is why the Buddha didn't institute meditation retreat centers. He instituted communities that would live together, look after their surroundings, have relationships with the lay people, in the very least being dependent on them for food, and providing an environment in which you learned all these different dimensions. So that what might look good from a one-dimensional point of view gets put into a multi-dimensional point of view, and you begin to see, oh, there's a defilement lurking in here, like the pride that can come into being very modest, very content. Or the laziness that can lurk behind being content or being dispassionate. So remember, the Buddha didn't teach in sound bites. He taught a full training, an all-around training. And we benefit when we keep all those dimensions in mind. <laughs>